Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus' name. Jesus. Jesus' name. Test, test. This is mic number one. Testing one, two. Test, 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 test. Test, 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 test. Praise God. Testing one, two. We're not using the other one, but we're, we're only using this one. Test, test, test. I just have to talk really loud. Test. Testing one, two. Test, test, test. It seems like... Test one. Testing one, two, three, four. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, why don't we just begin to move with God's spirit right now. Come on, church, why don't we just begin to flow with the Holy Ghost right now? Come on, we're coming expecting that God is going to do great things in this place. That he's going to do great things tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, why don't we just begin to activate the faith right now? Just begin to activate God's faith. Begin to activate God's authority. In the name of Jesus. Yes, Father. Come on, why don't we just begin to continue flowing in that vein right now. In the name of Jesus Christ. Let's just plug in with the Holy Spirit. Let's just plug in to what God is doing. In the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, more than anything, oh Lord, tonight we want to be in the flow. God, we don't come with preconceived ideas of what we think you're going to do. Lord, we come with, oh Lord, a sensitivity to your spirit, God. Lord, we're walking in that general direction of your spirit, but we want to be guided by the flow tonight. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, let us be sensitive to the flow of the Holy Ghost that is in this place in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. Yes, God, yes, Lord, yes, Father, I in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, come on, church, let's feel after the flow of the Holy Holy Ghost. Come on, let's feel after the flow of the Holy Ghost. Come on, let's not lose the sensitivity that God has given. Come on, we're not in it just for a service. We're not in it just to give our time. But Lord, we feel after the flow of the Holy Ghost 
that is in this place. God, in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Come on, church. This is not a task. This is a flow. Come on, what God is doing in this place. It's not religion. It's a flow. In the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, this is not a checklist. This is a flow. In the name of Jesus Christ. We're not here to fulfill, oh Lord, a list of obligations for the day. We're here, oh God, to flow with your spirit. In the name of Jesus. Come on, when was it the last time where we just begin to flow in the Holy Ghost like never before? Come on, I wonder if we could just flow into the vein that the Spirit of God is opening. I wonder if we could just flow with the channel of the Holy Ghost right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, come on church, we get out of the flesh in order to get into the spirit. Oh, in the name of Jesus Christ, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But Lord, we refuse to let the flesh get in the way regardless. We refuse to let the flesh get in the way regardless. Lord, we acknowledge that the flesh is weak, but God, we acknowledge that the spirit is willing. Lord, despite the weakness of my flesh, there is a willingness in the spirit. Oh, in the name of Jesus, come on, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It is joy in the Holy Ghost. Come on, your relationship with God is not supposed to be something dreaded. It's supposed to be something enjoyed. Come on, it's not meant to be rigid and emotionless. It's meant to be enjoyed. It's meant to be an experience. Come on, it's the path of life, not the path of sorrow. It's the path of life. Come on, it's great peace that have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. He Come on, your relationship with God is not a burden and a task that is so hard to carry out and that's so hard to fulfill. A relationship with God is empowered by the Holy Ghost. Come on, church, do whatever you have to do to get focused right now because God's doing something. Come on, why don't we just begin to forget about everything else 
and let it just be us and the flow of God's spirit. Oh, Come on, it's joy in the Holy Ghost. It is joy in the Holy Ghost. It is peace. It is perfect peace. Oh, it whose mind is stayed on thee, Father. Perfect peace. Oh, rianda la 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 ba kaelele me. Oh, rianda la 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 ba. Peace without blemish. Peace without imperfection. Oh, it's that peace that God wants to give. It's that peace that God wants to impart. Come on, you don't have to have it all figured out for God to, f- to flow in you right now. You don't have to be all perfect in order for God to do something in you and through you in this service. Come on. He's nigh to the brokenhearted. He taramando lo 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 coriandaye. Yalamando robo sandaye. Come on, somebody catch that revelation. You don't need to be perfect in order for God to use you. You just have to be willing. Come on, you may not know scripture like everybody else, but if you can get into a spirit of hunger and a spirit that desires God, He will use you. Hey, Kandala la 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 mandorobo saya. Oh, the andala la ba ki andala la ma. Come on, even though, even though David committed adultery, he was still a man after God's own heart. Come on, even his imperfections, it didn't get in the way of him writing psalms for the Holy Ghost. Come on, you're not so far that God cannot use you. Somebody catch that revelation right now. Somebody catch that spirit of revelation. Can I tell you, God's not looking for perfection. He is looking for intimacy. Come on, even though David was imperfect, he sought the face of God. He taramando lo He come on I feel a spirit of revelation right now I come against the spirit that says I'm not good enough for God to use me I come against the spirit that says I'm not good enough for God to speak to me Shalabo korianda la 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 haya. Come on, all that needs to be done in order for you to be used of God is just one word, blood. If you're covered with the blood, it doesn't matter the mistakes that were done in the past. If you have the forgiveness of sins, it does not matter. Oh, Jesus. I wonder if we could just worship him right now. Can we just exalt him right now? Come on, can we just thank the unblemished God? Can we just thank the God that has no equal, that has no rival? Can we just begin to thank that God? Oh, the Come on, why don't you just begin to feel after that right now? Come on, the Spirit of God is moving. Oh, 
God in the name of Jesus. God in the name of Jesus. God can use you. God can use you. God can use you. Somebody believe that right now. God can use me. God can use me. My God, my God, my God. Ikahataye. Shataramondo lo 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 Jesus name. Jesus name. I wonder if you could just hear me just for a moment. I feel like God wants to give some wisdom to somebody in this place. One morning or one night, I don't remember when it was, I was praying and I... I was just saying, God, I lack so many things that I know are necessary for me to reach the loss. I was expressing this desire. And I said, God, I said, Lord, sometimes I lack boldness. And it bothers me because I know I need to be bold in order to reach the, the lost. And he said to me, don't be discouraged by what you don't have or what you lack. And he showed me this this jar, this empty jar. And I saw the Lord, he just began to put several things in this jar. And he said, don't be afraid or feel insignificant or inadequate by what you lack. Because what you lack, I will begin to empower. And the very thing that you lack is the very thing that God will enable you to do. So when you feel, man, I don't have boldness like so-and-so. It's so hard for me to talk to people at my campus. so hard for me to do this. Don't even be discouraged. But be, be grateful and rejoice. Because what you lack, God will empower if it's his will. If you believe that, I wonder if you could receive that right now. Come on, some of you are going to step into places in the spirit and say, I don't have what it takes. I'm not bold enough. Don't be afraid. God will give you the boldness. Come on, what you lack, God will supply. Come on, somebody needs to hear that right now. What I lack, God will supply. What I don't have, God will give. The boldness that I feel like I don't have or I haven't attained, God will give it. Come on, if you want to love for souls and you're frustrated and say, why can't I love my neighbor? What you lack, God will give. Come on, what you lack, God will give. Come on, you may not have it, but God will give it. He's just looking for hands that are empty and that are ready to receive. I wonder if we can lift up our hands right now and whatever you feel that you lack in the spirit, whatever you feel like you need more of from God, I want you to just begin to think of that right now. And God is going to give it. God is going to supply it. Come on, every hand raised, every voice lifted right now. Father, by the authority of the word of God and the power that is in the name of Jesus, I release a love for souls. I release the boldness of the Holy Ghost receive it right now what you lack God will give what you lack God will give in the name of Jesus musician if you could just come 
in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, I feel like he's worthy of praise right now. Come on, is the provider and the supplanter, is he worthy of praise? Is he worthy of praise in the name of Jesus? Come on, why don't you just begin to call out to him right now? You are worthy of praise. I feel to share something really quick, if that's okay, Pastor. I heard almost a human spirit. I don't know who you are in this place, but I heard a human spirit. And you said to yourself, if I could only have just the desire to do the will of God. And there are sometimes you, you want to want what God has for you. But life gets in the way and your own desires get in the way and they kind of overshadow kind of what pastor was talking about. You can't really see clearly because something is blocking. But I want to tell you that if you would just give yourself to God, he will not only give you the desire to do his will, he will give you the ability to do his will. If you could just worship with us right now. If you could just begin to lift up your hands and lift up your voice to God and say, God, I'm here. Whatever you want to do with me. Lord, I may not have what it takes right now, but I know you can provide and you can supply. In the name of Jesus.
You are free in Jesus' name. You are made free, set free by the blood of the Lamb. Free to pursue Him. Freedom from sin. Freedom of choice to choose Him. And when you choose Him, He begins to empower you. When you choose Him, it begins to happen. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, would you lift up your voice right now? Would you cry unto the Lord? Would you cry unto Him? Would you begin to pray in the Spirit? Would you begin to speak what God is giving to you in your mind? In the name of Jesus Christ. Oh will do in this place Lord hear our cry Lord hear our cry be lifted high in this place Lord we want you no one else will this place 
Is he your desire this evening? Hallelujah. The Bible says that we can feel after him. If happily we could find him when we feel after him. Though he is not far from each and every one of us. How many of you sense the presence of the Lord in this place? How many of you realize he heard your cry? He has received your worship. It has ascended into heaven and what has taken place here tonight will pay dividends down the road in your walk with him. Somebody believe that right now. What has happened tonight, you will reap the benefits of it down the road in your walk with God. Somebody begin to rejoice. Somebody begin to believe it in Jesus' name. Chains are broken. Eyes are open. Enlightenment. Miracles. Signs. Wonders. Follow them that believe. And God confirming his word. With signs following. Somebody begin to expect that more. And more every day in your life. As you begin to speak the word of God. As you begin to speak the rhema of God. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you for your presence, oh. Thank you for your presence, oh God. In the name of Jesus Christ. Yo rata la mayanda la bocosite le ananasata. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Would you pray for our connect groups right now? Father. In the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, a connect group tomorrow with in Mission Viejo, God. The following day, Friday, oh Lord. In Elisa Viejo, Father, we claim this neighborhoods. Would you do that right now? Would you claim that neighborhood in Jesus' name for the glory of God? For the glory of God, for many souls to be saved. For herein is your Father glorified that you and I bear much fruit. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Amen. This coming Sunday, we have Brother Pascal coming. If you could keep that in prayer all week long, the remainder of this week, come early. Some say come early. Amen. Let's fill the house. Let's come expecting in Jesus' name. Also, this coming Monday, the 17th, God has miraculously opened UCI Monday, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Then Wednesday, October 19th, same time, 9 a.m., 2 p.m. We'll give you more details about that. And Saddleback also is happening and there's a correction there on the flyer. It is actually the 24th, which is a Monday. So it's a Monday and a Wednesday, 24 and 26, the same time, 9 a.m. to 12 noon. Keep in prayer those that have been filled with the Holy Ghost and those that have been baptized in Jesus' name as a result of that. Amen. And we're so thankful what God is doing in this place. Irvine Spectrum is also happening. Amen. If you would project that here so I could see it. October 22nd, uh, Saturday, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. over at Irvine Spectrum. And looking ahead, way ahead, Brother Dobbs is coming on November 6th. Amen. And we are looking forward to Brother Dobbs ministering on November 6th. And don't forget, friends and family, the Thanksgiving service Start inviting your friends. Start inviting your families. Amen. And let's fill the house of the Lord. Would you pray one more time for all of these, Father? Lord, we don't, we don't want to do anything just on our own, God. We're going to follow the leading of your Spirit. Lord, in these events, so oh God, that you have allowed us to be a part of, help us to play the role of your body on the earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray you put the burden of the laborers, the reapers, upon, oh God, your people, your body, that we become the body of Christ on the earth. Would you pray that prayer right now that you become the body of Christ 
on the earth in the name of Jesus to be your body, Lord. To be your body, oh God. Hallelujah. What a tremendous privilege. And also what a tremendous responsibility to be given the, the, the privilege to be the body of Christ on the earth. And also comes the tremendous responsibility that because you are the body of Christ on the earth, the, the propagation of the gospel is in your hands. The people could hear the gospel through the body of Christ. Amen. Would you pray one more time because we need that divine empowerment to be the body on the earth in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Would you pray right now that God would empower you, boldness, love, and passion to reach for the lost, to knock on the door, to get a door hanger, if you would, uh, a card outside in the lobby. Amen. To, to have something in your person all the time so you could share the gospel, a conversation piece that we could be the body of Christ on the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother John's going to come tonight. He's going to teach that we may be empowered to be the body of Christ on the earth. In Jesus' name, would you worship the Lord? Jesus Christ was multilingual. He spoke at least three languages that we know of. We know that he could read and he could write. Because he read the Torah or the Old Testament when he went into the temple. And we know that he could write because he wrote the sins of the people who were accusing that woman. So he spoke three languages, he could read, he could write. So what I'm trying to say is that education is a great and wonderful thing. You can use that for the glory of God. Look at all these beautiful uh, 13 books that Apostle Paul wrote, and he was a scholar. I mean, he was probably the most educated disciple of Jesus Christ. Education helps you learn the Word of God, study the Word of God, research the Word of God, and teach with confidence. So, so we're going to, I've already taught this on this once before, and we're going to go through that. Tonight is going to be three parts compacted in one. So I'm going to show you different manifestations of God and how does Jesus Christ fit in that and if there are different manifestations then Father, Son and Holy Ghost couldn't be the only three there would be a lot more so if you go by the Trinity why just three then the Godhood would be very crowded if there were more than one, right? so but since we are apostolics we know the truth and but we need to learn how to answer those who do not believe like us and we have to do it with confidence amen hallelujah so what does the bible teach but the oneness of the God had different manifestations. So we're going to separate the truth from the tradition and facts from fiction. Because there's a lot of fiction out there. And people twist the scriptures to fit their agenda of what they want to believe. So separating 
the facts from the fiction requires, first you have to have the desire to know the truth. Desire to study the Word of God and rightly divide the Word of God. Clear, clearing your mind from your own logic, from your own human logic, reasoning, preconceived notions and philosophy. Studying the Bible with the author, the Holy Spirit. Praying and asking God for revelation and having the desire to abide in the Word of God. So what is actually rightly dividing? To make a straight cut, to dissect, to expound correctly the divine message. In other words, you have to take a piece of cloth, you have to cut straight, you can't go to the left, to the right, in between all, because you're going to ruin everything and you're going to destroy it and it's going to be of no use. And that is exactly the same way the Word of God is. And unfortunately, a lot of people do that for their own agenda. So study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman need, needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Then Jesus said unto those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciple indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So that is the only way we are going to know the truth if we abide in his word. Reading the Bible just before Christmas or Easter isn't going to do it. So, so is God one? Is God three? Is God plural? Or is God one? Or is God a trinity? We're going to help this young girl eliminate her confusion. She's about to have a nervous breakdown. So, manifestation of one God to humanity since creation. Yahweh, and by the way, that is the correct way to spell it because the Hebrew word Vav is actually spelled with V, not with W. And I looked it up, all those words. So, if you want to learn in Hebrew, it's Yod, He, Vav, He. And Vav is always pronounced with V. So, is one of the only and true God and cannot, cannot be, I missed the B in there, a second or third person of the Trinity or part of the coalition of gods. He's the only God. And because of his love, God has remained deeply engaged with humanity and have made his presence known as one God, yet various manifestations known as theophanies, Incarnation, and then Holy Spirit has its kind of own unique category. So what are the theophanies and how they differ from incarnation? Do they strongly bring concurrence or confusion to the oneness of God? Do they confirm or contradict the concept of one God? Holy Spirit, theophany, incarnation, both, or some other form of manifestation? So theophanies are where God makes his presence known to his creation. Theophanies are sudden and temporary manifestations of God in tangible form, such as God revealing himself as human or angelic being. Theophanies are short-term in duration and include visual display, such as the burning bush, shaking and covering of the Mount Sinai in smoke, that also includes visions and dreams, wind on the day of Pentecost, and the tongues of fire. Theophanies are not separate or distinct being co-equal, co-eternal to God. They are manifestations of one God. Theophanies of God in the Bible, let's look at the Old Testament first. God spoke face to face with Abraham about the uh, but to Adam about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Bible doesn't exactly say in what form, but we know that he spoke to Adam, right? Say so in the cool of the day, God would talk to Adam 
but cool of the day was more like for Adam's benefit, not for God's benefit, right? So, and it does get pretty hot in that area. And you know, they have actually located the Garden of Eden. It is into the, close to the Persian Gulf between the countries of Iran and Iraq. And they found the satellite imagery of all those four rivers. You can't find them on Earth, the two rivers, but if you look at from the, from the from above the earth through the satellites, they actually found those and they know where it was. So then God spoke face to face with Abraham about the promise of Isaac. That was a theophany. It was for a short period of time. Jacob wrestled with and saw God face to face. And his name was changed to Israel. God spoke to Moses from a burning bush. Cloud and pillar of fire during Exodus from Egypt to Canaan. And fire and cloud, which is water, are also the two representations of the Holy Spirit as well. See, God as an angelic being appeared to Joshua near Jericho and spoke to Job out of whirlwind. Those were all theophanies. So theophanies of God in the Bible. So let's look at the New Testament. Jesus appears temporarily to two disciples who were walking to Emmaus. And then while they were sharing bread, all of a sudden he disappears. Jesus appears to his disciples and shares meal with them. Thomas believes Jesus as, as he sees him. Right? It was, it was sudden. He appeared to him. Jesus cooks breakfast on the beach for the disciples. See, with glorified body, Jesus stood in the middle of the disciples without opening or unlocking the door first. So what is incarnation? So physical presence of God through an incarnated being, human body made of flesh and bones, such as Jesus Christ, the begotten Son of God. Incarnations are long-term in duration. Jesus' life on earth was 33 years. Jesus Christ was the expressed or the human image of one God. Jesus was God in flesh. Jesus confirms that he was God in flesh. Thomas acknowledges Jesus as God. The Magi's and the disciples worship Jesus as God. Jesus was I Emmanuel. I know we say Emmanuel, but the actual Hebrew word is Emmanuel. M means with. Manu us and El is Elohim. So God with us. Jesus was mighty God and everlasting Father. Isaiah confirms that. So Holy Spirit has its own like a unique category. See, there has not been a tangible physical manifestation of the Holy Spirit since the baptism of Jesus Christ and the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago as they were unique and rare ex uh, experiences. Yet the believers enjoy the long-term presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives through the infilling of the Holy Spirit since the dawn of the church. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. Then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the promise is unto you and to your children and to all those who are afar off. That means it is long-term. So, short-term physical manifestation occurred in the following incidents, like Luke, in the book of Luke, Jesus was baptized too, and as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape, like a dove, upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased, and I'm going to explain that a little bit more. So, Acts 2, uh, 3 to 4, the day of Pentecost in the upper room, and divided tongues as the fire appeared upon them and rested upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them, gave them the utterance. So, Theophanism, Jesus Christ, God incarnate, and the tangible presence of the Holy Spirit are all manifestations of one God. They do not take, a separate, take on separate identities or morph into separate beings 
co-equal and co-eternal with God. So if every manifestation of God turned a separate entity, then Godhead would be very crowded and contain more than one being. So having known about all these manifestations, is God still one? Is God still a trinity? Why couldn't it be more than one manifestation in the trinity? Why couldn't God be quadrinity or octrinity? It could be, right? Because if you look at all those manifestations, but God is one. So that's the difference here. I'm going to give you a brief. So Apostles Doctrine 33 AD, oneness. One God, three manifestations or roles. Jesus, apostles, and the early church adhered, believed, preached, and affirmed the Old Testament belief that there is only one God. In Deuteronomy and Ephesians, it all tells us, and there's more than one scriptures. There are at least close to 50 of them. So Nicene Doctrine, which was 325 AD, so that was like 300 plus years later, somebody decides that the oneness doesn't fit their agenda because they can't win more people to, to Christ and build their church. So rather than introducing them to the one God, belief in one God, they come up with this doctrine so that they can bring the, the heathens into the church, the pagans into the church. So, so they even did more destruction to their soul than before. Because now they are confused, or at least they were misled to believe that there is not one God, but there are three gods. And that existed only in pagan and heathen religions. So in my view, they even destroy their soul even more. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three separate being, co-equal, co-eternal. All three worshipped as one God. That completely contradicts the Jewish and early Christian monotheistic beliefs. See, even to this day, Jews have a hard time becoming a Christian because they say, we believe in one, you believe in three. Why should we come and believe your faith and believe your God? Because we have been monotheistic. That has been in our blood since the day we are born into this earth. And even certain people in Israel, they were asked, do you identify yourself more close to the Christians or to the Muslims? And you will be surprised at how many Jewish people said that they identify themselves more with the Muslims because they believe in one God. And that's sad. Because Jesus came to the Jews first. He came, he came because he came to, to free the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But yet, this, this damnable belief of the Trinity uh, is isolating the Jews and the Muslims. But I am praying that God will reveal to them. And he will. Because remember, there is just a revival that is beginning in Israel. And they are beginning to come to know through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So def definition of oneness theology. One God has revealed himself as Father through his Son in redemption. As the Holy Spirit by emanation in recognition, in regeneration. Emanation is a being or force that is manifestation of God. Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh. He is both God and man. So there is one invisible God with no distinction of persons. To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, and the only God be honor and glory forever and ever. So oneness of God is singleness of God, no plurality of God. There is only one God, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is not binary, ternary, having three parts or divisions. God is not a trinity. God does not share his glory, throne, or power, or heaven. Jesus Christ was the manifestation of one God. Jesus Christ was not the second person of the trinity. Holy Spirit was the manifestation of one God. Holy Spirit is not the third person of the Trinity. Old and New Testament acknowledge the existence and singularity of one God. Old and the New Testament do not deviate from the oneness of God and monotheism. Plurality and multiplicity of gods 
existed in pagan religion and was never taught by the prophets of the Old Testament, Jesus Christ, the apostles, and the early church of the New Testament. Only Jews, apostolic Christians, and Muslims believe in monotheistic concept of one God. Over 50 times the Bible calls God the Holy One, but never the Holy Two or Holy Three. And those are the Old Testament and the New Testament scriptures. So Jesus Christ himself acknowledged and, and reiterated the Jewish concept of one God. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered, the first of all commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Even Jesus Christ didn't believe in the Trinity. <laughs> so so what, is, uh, what is Trinity? Trias, Trinitas, or Trinity is defined as triune God, three in one, co-equal, co-eternal. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. By the way, God the Father is in the Bible. God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are never mentioned in those words. They are not there. And Bible never refers to the co-equal and co-eternal God because God does not share his glory with anyone. One God eternally exists in three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and that these three are one God, co-equal, co-eternal, having precisely the same nature and attribute and worthy of precisely the same worship, confidence, and obedience. Now, the Trinitarian tried to get around that and say, well, oh, it's a composite unity. Like, and they use the scripture where it says that husband and wife, they shall be one flesh. But what they forget is saying it's one flesh, not one spirit. And that's the difference. But they will use that because there's only one spirit, which means there's one God. So, Trinity is not a biblical doctrine. George H. H. Gallup, International Institute, polls that according to August 13, 2003, of the Christian surveys, three-fourths, 75% expressed a strong belief in the Trinity that the God, the Bible, is one in essence but distinct in persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So I believe that that number was much higher a few hundred years ago, but because of the apostolic faith growing and people coming to the knowledge of God, it has gone down to 75%, but that's still pretty high. It was never a Judeo-Christian belief. Trinity was never a Judeo-Christian belief. Trinity and the concept of multi-gods existed among heathen and pagan religions, never in Judaism and early Christianity. Pre-Christianity, Gentiles, non-Jewish worship, multiple gods, and Trinitarian deities. So look at these pagan deities, Chinese, three pure ones in Taoism. Jade, I don't know how to pronounce the Chinese name, supreme and grand. And then Indian, it was Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu. Chaldeans, which is a Babylonian, Anos, Elinos, and Eos. And then Babylonian Trinity, Ulamus, Ulosrus, and Elorin. Egyptian, Amun, and I'm not going to try to pronounce the other one, Osiris, and Isis, and Horus, and Set. So they have two different trinities, Egyptian. And the Greek had, Greek had Uranus, Cronus, and Eos. And then that was the first one, and the second trinity was Eos, Poseidon, and Adionius. And then, of course, Scandinavian had Thor, Woden, and Frico. Yeah, so don't play with the hammer of Thor. So oneness is based on the Holy Ghost-inspired scripture of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Surely the Lord will do nothing but reveal his secrets unto his servants, 
the prophets. All scripture was given by inspiration of God. So oneness was revealed to the prophets. So Trinity was manufactured at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Trinity was not inspired by the Holy Ghost. It was established by a vote of 300 bishops of the Catholic Church. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the false prophets are prophesying to you. They will fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth, mouth of the Lord. So, but though we or an angel from heaven preach another gospel unto, uh, unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. See, Apostle Paul was pretty harsh. He said, if anybody preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. He, he spoke that strongly. And Trinity is not an apostolic doctrine. So who was Jesus Christ? Was he God in flesh or was he the second person of the Trinity? I know why you apostolics are quiet because you know the answer. So we're going to prove to you from the scriptures who exactly he was. God incarnate in flesh, not a second person. Son born of a virgin will be called Emmanuel, God with us. Son born of a virgin will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was made flesh. God was manifested in the flesh. Expressed image of God. Son born of a virgin will be called Emmanuel. So that is the old and the new both. So as soon as you guys are done taking pictures. So why Jesus Christ was God? Because all things were created through, through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. So does this seem like someone who would be the second person of the Trinity? Jesus saw Satan cast out of heaven as lightning. 286,282 miles, almost 300,000 miles per second. So we are complete in Jesus Christ. If we are complete in Jesus Christ, then we don't need the second or the third person. See, all titles of the deity can be applied to Jesus Christ. All titles of the divine personality are manifested in Jesus. Jesus owns the title of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is not God the Son. He is the Son of God. See how it changes the meaning? Not a distinct being of a triune God, because He is God. Not co-equal to God and not co-eternal. And yes, there's a scripture that the Bible says that he considered it not robbery to be equal to God, but we will explain that. Jesus Christ is either God or he's not. If he is God, then he cannot be the second person of the Trinity, which makes him a weaker or an inferior God. Jesus was God in flesh. Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead incarnate. Beware lest... Any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In other words, Jesus is not in the Godhead. Godhead is in Jesus. Trinity switches that. They say that Godhead, Jesus is in the Godhead. But no, this scripture says that Godhead is in Jesus Christ. He's the fullness of all of that. Jesus Christ was God of the two Testaments. He was the Father in creation, Son in redemption, Holy Spirit in regeneration. All names and titles of the deity are applied to Jesus. Creator, I am, Almighty One, Savior, Deliverer, Forgiver of sins, Healer, Shepherd, Alpha, and Omega. So let's start with the first one. And we will go to the Old and the New Testament. 
You alone are Lord. You have made or created heavens, the heavens, the heavens of heavens, will, and all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all them, all of them, and the heavenly host bows down before you. Nehemiah, that's the Old Testament. So he, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for on him all things were made, created, just like the previous scripture of the Old Testament says, God created, Jesus created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers of, or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. How about the I am? God addresses Moses on Mount Sinai, on Mount Horeb in 1440 BCE, before the Christian era. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, that thou, that thou shalt, thou say unto the children of Israel that I am hath sent me unto you. So what is I am? That means I am all encompassing. I am all complete. Everything is in me. Everything exists in, in, in me. All things in him. The universe is contained in him. And then Jesus Christ addresses the Jews 30 BC. 30 CE, I'm sorry, Christian era. Then the Jews said unto him, You are not 50 years old yet, and you have seen Abraham. Truly, truly, I tell you, Jesus declared, before Abraham was, I am. So God says, I am. Jesus Christ says, I am. The Almighty One. God is the Almighty One. Jesus is the Almighty One. Restore us, Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. And then Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, said the Lord God, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. The Savior. I even I am the Lord, and there is no Savior beside me, Isaiah. And then Jesus Christ is the Savior, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Deliverer, the Old Testament. And he, David, said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my Deliverer. And then Jesus Christ, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he had anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He had sent me to, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, to set at liberty them that were, bru that were bruised. So God is the deliverer. Jesus is the deliverer. Forgiver of sins. So God is the forgiver of sins. I, even I, God, am the one who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sin no more. Jesus Christ, then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on bed. When Jesus saw, he said to the paralytic son, be of good cheer, your sins be forgiven you. The healer and the Lord will take away from you all sickness and will afflict you with none of the terrible diseases of the, of the Egyptians which you have known, but will lay them all on those who hate you. And then Jesus Christ is the healer, and great multitude came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. The shepherd, God is the shepherd, Jesus is the shepherd. He will feed his flock like a shepherd, and he will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in the bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Now may the God of peace who brought you up, our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Alpha and Omega, God is the beginning and the end. Thus says the Lord God, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord 
of hosts, I am the first and I'm the last. Beside me, there is no God. And then Jesus, in Hebrews, it's written about him, I am the Alpha and I'm the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and was and is to come, the Lord Almighty. And who is the one to come? Jesus Christ, right? So, scriptures that Trinitarians will use against you. So, they will say, okay, in the beginning, God, Elohim, plural, created. So, they say, okay, since Elohim is plural, there must be more than one. And God said, let us, and they will use that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then Jesus thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus baptized, voice came from heaven, dove appears. So they're saying, see, there's a trinity right there. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the question would be, since the word Elohim is grammatically plural in Hebrew, then the concept of triune God and trinity must be true. First of all, Elohim is not a Hebrew word. It is a Babylonian word that the Babylonians used for multiple gods. But in, in the Hebrew Bible, see how they capitalized it. So instead of using the word for multiple gods, they used it for multiple attributes of God. One God, multiple attributes. That's what it means. And we are going to show you that. So the short answer is no. Let's look at the detailed answer. So the word Elohim is mentioned 2,500 times in the Tanakh or the Old Testament. Grammatically, Elohim in Hebrew does imply plurality, but not plurality of persons. If the connotation is plurality of person, then it would invalidate the entire concept of one God. And the one God scriptures such as, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Isaiah, I even, I am the Lord. And besides me, there is no Savior. And Jesus answered, the first commandment, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. So, now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, and only one God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And remember, in Hebrew language, there are words that have been borrowed from other languages because it was not necessarily a sophisticated language. So when the language was coming into existence, they were surrounded by other people. So they began to pick up different words and brought into Hebrew. But none of those words that they came in, they ever changed the concept of one God that the Jewish people knew. So Jewish and Gentile Bible scholars agree that it was not a plurality of persons. In Hebrew, Elohim is plural of excellence, similar to plurality of majesty, also referred to as majestic plural or royal plural. When people in the positions of power and authority, such as kings, queens, monarchs, and nobles, refer to themselves as in plural form, such as we or us, Instead of I, they were projecting greatness, power, strength, majesty, glory, prestige, and control. So God's name, Elohim, has these attributes. God is one. God is a spirit. God is eternal. God is living. God is a creator. God is our father. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's all present. God is holy. God has power. God has authority. God is immutable, which means he doesn't change. God has character and God is love. That's why the word Elohim is used for God. Not multiple gods, but multiple attributes of one God. Say, beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. So that is God talking to, to Moses that he's going to send an angel. So he said, my name is in him. So if the name of God is in him, that means he has some of the attributes in him as well. So in other words, he is bearing the name of God. 
So when God gives you that name, and when he picks a person, he also gives you those attributes along with that. So we have the attributes of God. When God gives us the Holy Spirit, we have some of the attributes of God in us. Neither is salvation in any other, for there is none other name given under heaven among men, whereby we must, must be saved. So there's only one name, and that's Jesus Christ, and he had all these attributes, everything. So Elohim, one God with multiple attributes. So that's how you approach that. So let's look at this one. The word Elohim is also used for Moses when God empowers him to go to Egypt. Yet Moses remained one individual. Moses did not get replicated into three or multiple beings. Because remember, God uses the same, the same word that's used for God, Elohim. God uses the same word for Moses. Uh, that's, I don't think you can read that here. So said he to Yahweh, see Moses, I have made you, and that's a little bit small, but it says Elohim, that's Greek and Hebrew. I have made you Elohim unto Pharaoh. In other words, I have made you as God unto Pharaoh. But Moses still remained one person, not multiple beings. So what is actually royal plural or royal we? The English royal we or Latin pluralis, majestatis, dates to the late 12th century around the time of Henry II, the King of England, and his successor Richard I meant God and I invoking the divine right of the king. It has since come to under, be understood that a monarch using the royal we is speaking for the entire state. So when the emperor spoke and said we, it projected majesty, power, that I am the ruler of a nation and I am speaking on their behalf because I have that kind of a power and authority. So when God says we, God is doing the same thing. So Queen Elizabeth II, she just passed away recently, frequently referred to herself as we, a tradition established hundreds of years ago. See, keen fans of the royal family and Queen Elizabeth will have noted that the royal often uses the term we to refer to herself or oneself. Linguistically speaking, the royal we is known as the majestic plural using, used exclusively by the society's ruling elite. So according to the New Yorker, Mary Norris, the peculiar form of the address dates back to roughly 600 years to the reign of King Henry II and his successor, King Richard I. Other kings and queens operated on the same supposition, and when King Henry and Richard used the royal we, it was to address the fact which meant God and I. Because the kings of Europe really thought that they were appointed by God. And it was their divine right. So that's why. But they're saying 600, it went way back. Julius Caesar actually used to use that word as well. Because he was the emperor, which, which is bigger than the king. All right, so let's go to the next one, Genesis 126. So it is going to be kind of a similar answer to that. Let us make man in our own image. So since God is using the word us, that is the proof that there is a trinity or plurality. So the answer, the answer is no, it does not prove the trinity as it will contradict the monotheistic faith of the Jews, early Christians, and one God apostolic believers and Muslims. So there are, let's, Two answers to that. The first answer is Jewish and Gentile Bible scholars agreed that God was talking to the angels when he used those words. Again, he's talking as the royal plural because God is the king as well, right? So the second answer is that God was speaking as in plural, plurality of majesty, also referred to as majestic plural or royal plural. When people in positions of power, and that's the same thing, I'm just going to repeat it. They are speaking for the entire empire, kingdom, or country, 
and projecting greatness, power, strength, majesty, glory, prestige, and control. For example, Queen Victoria, upon hearing a tasteless joke, is said to have replied, we are not amused. Are you with me or are you falling asleep? <laughs> I hope you're not. So let's go to, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the question would say, see, it says the Word was with God, meaning God and Jesus existed together. So there were at least two in heaven. So let's read it. There was only one in heaven, not two, right? So the Word does not mean separate or being entity. The Word in John 1 comes from the Greek word logos. And Sister Lachika has taught in that, and I have mentioned a few times. And which means plan, thought, or blueprint of something that has not yet been materialized, but will occur soon or in the future. It is a plan. So also I want to explain to you the word with in the Bible in those times had a different meaning. Like when they say she was with child. No, that doesn't mean that there was she and there was a child separately. That means it might have been still in the early stages. But they say, oh, she is with child. But they're not two separate people sitting. But it was translated differently in those days when the word with meant. But in, in modern days, the word with is, that's why it is hard to understand for a lot of people that scriptures, because they don't completely understand the Eastern thought. And you have the responsibility to explain to them, and that's why we are teaching you all this, that it meant differently. So in modern day, the word with means that two separate beings together, or more than one. So let's say that Brother Dylan says, Brother John, can you take me to go buy boba? <laughs> so then Dana goes to her mother and says, have you seen Dylan say, oh, he's with Brother John. That means they are together. But the word had a different meaning back then. So John 1.1 1, 1 is revealing that from the very beginning, God had a plan, Logos, in his mind. Okay, It was in the mind of God that one day Jesus Christ will be born. The word made flesh, plan materialized to redeem mankind. Now, it is true that Jesus existed from the beginning, even before the world uh, existed, right? Because he even prayed, he said, Lord, glorify me with thee with the glory that I had before the world was. So he did exist, but not as a separate being. Because then, that means there were two gods in heaven. So Jesus Christ himself acknowledges that. And now, O Father, glorify me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Which means Jesus is acknowledging, yes, it is true that I had glory with you. But glory will actually come to pass after his resurrection. But until that point, it was in the mind of God. Jesus Christ will be born of a virgin. He will do miracles. He will heal people. Uh, he, will, he will go to the cross. He will shed the blood. He will redeem mankind. He will be buried. He will rise. And then he will be exalted. All of those things will happen. Pretty elaborate plan, right? So, answer two to John 1.1. 1, 1. So, if Jesus Christ exists as a separate being with God, it contradicts the Bible, definitely the oneness, and it also contradicts the Trinity itself. See, because according to Trinity, Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. Jesus is co-equal with God. Jesus is co-eternal with God. And then they go on top of that, say Jesus is God. So if Jesus existed in heaven and God the Father existed in heaven, then they are contradicting themselves because then they're saying basically that there were two gods in heaven. Jesus as a separate God and then God the Father as God. So they are contradicting themselves. So Trinity, Trinity contradicts itself in accord, and that's what I just said, that Jesus existed as a separate entity in heaven, then that means that there are two gods in heaven, God the Father and God the Jesus. Yeah. 
So interpretation of uh, John 1.1. 1, 1. So oneness affirms that Jesus existed as Logos, plan of redemption in the mind of God, not as a separate being. Trinitarian interpretation of John 1.1 1, 1 is a complete contradiction of one God and monotheistic belief. Now, Trinitarian interpretation contradicts the Bible, but there are 50 plus scriptures refer to God as only one God. And see now that even I am, and there is no God with me. See, God is saying it with absolute clarity. There is no God with me in heaven. And when I read that scripture, man, I was excited about our apostolic faith. It is right there. There is no other God in heaven. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Hurry up, Brother Paul. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so here I'm going to give you a very simple how the Logos. Sister Kathy is not here. She would have enjoyed that. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Logos is the plan. So logic, see the word Logos comes from the word logic, which means what you think in your mind. Reason, plan, or blueprint of something that has not yet been materialized, but will occur soon or in the future. So these are the stages of the plan. It begins in the mind. And then it is put on the paper. And Sister Kathy would probably can explain it to you even better because she's studying to be an architect. And that's, when I did that, I actually thought of her. <laughs> so it's in the mind first, then you put it on the paper, and then it gets materialized. So that, uh, that building, first somebody thought it in their mind. They said, oh, I want to create this beautiful building. Then they created the blueprint, and then it was the completion, right? So now how does that come to pass in the Bible. Let's take a look. The stages of God's plan. The word was with God. That means it was the thought that began, right? And the word logos or plan of salvation through Jesus Christ was with God, meaning it existed in the mind of God. Jesus did not exist as a separate being until his physical birth. And then God gave us the blueprint in the Bible. God revealed his plan. And it was in the, what, Psalms 20, Isaiah 53, Psalms 120. Uh, in the book of Genesis, that's where the very first prophecy, that I will put enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed. And who was the woman's seed? It was Jesus Christ. So, so it, was, it was in the mind of God, then God gave us the blueprint in the Bible, and then it, the completion happened 2,000 years ago. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, died, buried, and resurrected. So I see thought, blueprint, completion. Thought, blueprint, and completion. Philippians 2.6, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, so the Trinitarians say, see, he was equal to God. Jesus Christ himself and the Bible says that he was equal to God. Yes, he was, but not the way you are saying it, not as a separate being. Since Jesus Christ was equal to God, isn't that the proof that there's a second person of the Trinity? And the answer is no. You cannot be equal to someone if there is not someone to be equal to. Right? So, Brother Dylan, come up here. I want to demonstrate this. Look at this handsome young man. See, let's say that Brother Dylan and I, we are both the CEO of the Fortune 500 company. Okay. We both went to Harvard University, graduated with honor, have a PhD in business administration. Sister Dana is going to get there one day. <laughs> and he has managed a Fortune 500 company for 10 years, I have managed that. So, so far, we're all on equal level, right? So, 
the board of directors says, why should we hire him over you or why or vice versa, right? So they look at all that. We have the same level of education. We are managing the same Fortune 500 companies. We have the same pattern of thinking. Maybe clothing style is a little different. <laughs> but then they say, okay, but we notice one thing, that his companies in the fourth quarter of 2021 made extra $2 million. But your company lost $2 million. So what did you do wrong? Now, all of a sudden, the picture changes, right? We are not on the equal footing. But if everything was equal, then that means I could be Brother Dylan or Brother Dylan could be me. But in the earthly realm, that's not possible. So the only, in the spiritual realm, the only one who could be equal to Jesus Christ was God and Jesus himself. They were equal to each other. And that is the only way he was equal to God, not because he was the second person of the Trinity. Go ahead. Thank you. So, I mean, are we good? Does it make sense, right? So Jesus was God. So that is why we are equal to God. So let's look at Isaiah. That's why he was equal to God. So therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you should call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. First Timothy 3.16, and beyond controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on the world, and received up in the glory. So those scriptures confirm that Jesus Christ was God in flesh because he was equal to God. Amen? He could not be equal to God if he had all those attributes of God, if he could do the same things that God did. So Mark 1 through 19, and it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth to Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan and straightaway came up out of the water. He saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven. Okay, a voice from heaven. That was the Father, right? Saying, thou art my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. So there is Jesus the Son, a spirit like a dove, and voice from heaven. So is that a oneness or the trinity? But of course, we already know the answer to that, right? But let's take a closer look. Okay. Can we get the sound to that? Or? Can you hear?
All right, so I'm done. If you have any questions, ask the pastor. <laughs> Why don't we worship the Lord right now? Could you just thank Him for the truth? The revelation of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And we're studying this so we could give an answer to them and be ready to give an answer to them who ask because of the reason of the hope that we have in Jesus' name. So let me ask you a question. If somebody asks you, do you believe in the Trinity? What are you going to say? Certainly not ask pastor or point to me when I'm there. But what are you going to say? Can you, can you answer that question to somebody beside you? If somebody asks you, hey, do you believe in the Trinity? What would be a concise response that perhaps not only would speak the truth based on, based on Scripture, but it will also cause them to think and challenge their own thinking or perhaps false concept about a triune God or a duality of the Godhead. So anybody want to respond? If somebody asks you, hey, do you believe in the Trinity? What would you say? G get a mic. Uh, you could be seated. Uh, so if somebody asks you, you know, just a random person that you're talking to and then you talk about God and talk about how good God is. And Because some people know, I actually heard about us, right? And while we were in Saddleback, actually somebody asked that question, do you believe in the Trinity? And so what would you say to them? And say, hey, do you believe in the Trinity? So I think I would, I would try to explain to the fact that, you know, the Trinity isn't really what it, you know, it should be. It's, just, it's all one God. Um, kind of explain it in a way to make out that, you know, all these different names and all these different, you know, they're just titles realistically that go for one person. So when you're talking about the Father, you know, you're talking about the Holy Spirit, you're talking about, you know, every name that's up there on the board right now, a lot of them are names but they're for one person, and some of them are just titles for that one person. Amen. That's good. Give him a hand. That's awesome. Right. You, you know, that, that, that thought right there, it made me think, you know, Isaiah 9, 6, and his name shall be called, right? But it doesn't say the name. It shall be called wonderful. Wonderful is not a name, right? Unless your name wonderful or, or love or prince. But those are functions of God, and His name shall be called wonderful. Uh, a good example, perhaps, would be most people call me pastor, right? That's not my name. I, I've got a name, but perhaps some don't even know my real name. You know, they just say pastor. What, what's his name? I don't know. Pastor. And, and it's the same concept of that in Isaiah 9-6. And His name shall be called. Anybody else? Somebody asks you, do you believe in one God? What are you going to say? Anybody? We're practicing so we could have, we could be ready. Um, I would have to say when they ask me if I believed in the Trinity, I would have to ask them to define what they consider the Trinity so I can answer it. Because they will might say, well, the Trinity of what, you know? 
And so I'll go, well, I believe in one God in many forms. And I always ask him, I go, well, God was the pillar of smoke. Do you make that a God? And I reference, you know, Jacob wrestling. And I'm like, did we make that another God? That would make four. And then I would just kind of kind of go through it. I name all these different manifestations of the one God. And they usually get quite upset with that. But I tell them, no, there is only one God, and he came in the form of a man. And the Holy Spirit is a form of God, and so forth. Amen. Now, I want to discourage you to making them upset because you want to win them. And I think we've discussed this last Wednesday as well. The spirit that that comes out of you as you give answers is more important really than your answer. You, you got you to gotta have the love of God flowing through you. Does that make sense? Anybody else? Edwin, you want to take a stab at it? If I, if I don't know anything and I come up to you, hey, Edwin, your buddy in the Marine Corps, you know, in the fox, foxhole, is bleeding. And he said, hey, if I die, is there one God? <laughs> yep, there's only one God. So, so the way I will put it is like, um, well, y'all know me as Edwin, but I got, I got many titles. Like, I'm an uncle, I'm a grandson, I'm a son. I got nicknames. I'm not going to say all of them. They're not appropriate. But at the end of the day, I'm, it's just one me. I have many names, just like how in the Bible they refer to God. At, um, they give him many names, many titles. Awesome. Amen. But Paul, what are you going to say? I come up to you. Do you believe in the Trinity? Do you guys believe in the Trinity? Uh, do I believe in Trinity? No, we d no, I do not. I believe there's one God, uh, and His name is Jesus. And you know, again, the three descriptions of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are just the descriptions and attributes of a person, but not our titles of a person, but not of God. There is only you know when you sign your checkbook, you sign it as your name, not not you as a son. You as father or you as husband, you sign it your name. If you sign it as a father, there's no there's no power in that check. It does not give anybody authority to cash it or do a transaction. And the same goes with the name, name of Jesus. That's where the power is, not the father, not the son, not the Holy Spirit, not those titles, but the name itself. Amen. Anybody else want to take a stab at it? Jesus' name. All right. You know, when, when, you know, you could be direct. And I like what you said, Brother Paul, you know. I, I, would, I, I, I would suggest to you don't answer a question with, an, with a question. Does that make sense? For example, you know, if, because that then presents, I believe, even in your relationships, you know, if your your son or your daughter or your husband or, or wife asks you, "Hey, did you have you taken the trash? Have you brought the trash bin in?" And you go, "Have you?" Answering a question with a question is antagonistic. Does that make sense? You could be direct, like what Brother Paul said. Well, well, I don't believe in the Trinity, and tone is very important. Or you could say, you know, I believe they are three manifestations of one God. And then you could proceed with your, with your explanation. I know some use the egg as the analogy of the Trinity. You know, it's like the egg. You have the shell. You have the, the plasma. Is that what they call them? The white, the egg white? They call it a plasma, but maybe it's not. And it's the, the yolk. But still one egg. But those are separate things. You could take the shell and crush it and put it in an orchid flower pot. That's separate. 
you know, most, some people don't want to eat the yolk because it's got a lot of fat and cholesterol. And so they eat, they beat the whites to make frosting. And of course, it's tasty with the yolk. But those are three separate things. I, I like what Brother Anderson said. I don't know if you remember he, him sharing this. He said, God's like water. Right? Because He is living water. Water can go through different states. could be ice, steam, could be liquid. It's still water. Right? It could be water va- vapor. It could be a cloud. But it's still water. And it retains its, its properties, its characteristics, if you would, all throughout that process of different states. And that's what God is. He, he goes through different... He reveals Himself to different states, yet He is still one God. You know, I came across this scripture. I want to share this with you. Uh, this is Romans 1 verse 20. It says, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Catch that. The invisible things of Him from, crea- from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made or by nature even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse what is it saying nature the creation of God testifies of his power and his Godhead and you know Colossians 2 20 greatest mystery right he's the head of all principality and power right and, 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 and the Godhead is in Christ. And, and when you think about that, it's really no different. So, so Jesus speaks in parables. And Father and Son, is, in essence, is a parable of a relationship. It's not separate beings. <clears throat> so when the Lord says, I and my Father are one, if you've seen me, You've seen the Father. And Jesus Christ is the first fruits among many brethren. So it's the same. He's our pattern. He has flesh. You have flesh. He was the great I am is in Him. You're filled with the Holy Ghost. It's in you. Not the quantity of God because He's everywhere. But the quality of God. But just because you're filled with the Holy Ghost doesn't mean you're two persons, right? And, and, and the nat- now going back to uh, Romans 1.1, 1, 1, the natural things are explaining the supernatural things to explain spiritual principles. And so you are the essence really of a testimony of one God because you have a soul and you have a body. Right? The Bible says that he was he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. He was human but a divine nature. So you have a soul but you also have a body. You look you, you interface with me with my soul through my body. Does that make sense? You interact with me. You don't interact directly with my soul, right? Because you can't see my soul. But my soul's inside my body, just like the Holy Ghost is in my body, because it's a parable. You, you, I'm in. I'm in this body. I'm interacting outside, also through my body. But I don't necessarily see just through my eyes. There's my soul sees through this interface, which is my body. And, and you interact. A lot of us forget how we look like. I know we, 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 inter- we, we have a picture of how we look like, right? Right? You, you, you have, I don't know, most people stop, they're like, they're mid-20s. That's their outlook. You know, they might be 60 years old, but somewhere in their mind, they, they, that's how they remember themselves. Are you with me? And, and you look out through this body. See, I, I'm in this body, my soul. I'm, I'm, I'm looking out through it. I'm not looking in this body. Does that make sense? And it's the same way with the man Christ Jesus. The Holy Ghost was inside of him. 
And that body just merely is an interface for us to interact with God. Now, why did He have to come in flesh? Why did the Father or the Great I Am have to come and interact with us in flesh through the person of Jesus Christ or through Logos? Right? Because He cannot interact with us as the great I am, which is infinite. So when the Lord says, in the beginning, God created by the mere fact of creation, there's a limitation to creation. Even the angels have limitation. We're created in this time and space. There's a limitation here. And God cannot be in this dimension because He is infinite. It's like, you know, I've got... uh, uh, a, a ton of, or let's say I got, uh, I, I don't know, a, uh, 10 gallons, and, and I want to put it all in here. It's not possible. So God cannot be in this dimension of time and space because He's, he's, un, he's infinite. And so He had to come and interact with us through Logos which is all the quality of God, but not the quantity of God. Does that make sense? Because something very bad could happen if He comes in our dimension. He'll destroy everything. Because it can't contain Him. That's why there's a scripture that says, no man has seen God at any time and lived. Only the Son of God, He has manifested Him. Or declared him. So, for so when you and I get to heaven, and you do plan to go there, right? I do, man. I, I'm making plans. When you and I get to heaven, the only representation of God that we will see is the express image of Jesus Christ. No man has seen, seen God at any time. The angels even cannot see the fullness of God at any time because they're eternal, they're not infinite. Right? So Buzz Lightyear, he said, to infinity and beyond. That, that's wrong. There, there's no beyond infinity. You know, I don't know if you have Netflix. There is actually a, I was watching it the other night. I didn't get to finish. It, it explores infinity. And if you're into numbers and formula and all that, it's, it's amazing. Uh, they have a formula that then infinity equals one. And I go, wow, that's that's... And these, you're talking to physicists and mathematicians and, and all that. Because there, you, you could divide numbers into infinity. From zero to one, you could divide and divide it. You have decimals after decimal, 0.01, 0.02. Then you got 0.001, 0.002. Then 0.0001. Then 0.000012. It, it goes on forever. And I go, Wow. In fact, his signature is in everything. Praise God. So when Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, for the invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood of things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Last point, and we'll go eat. Hopefully, Denny's is still open. When Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, He used the parable of physical birth to relate to the spiritual birth, right? So what did he say? Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then Nicodemus said, what are you talking about? Can I go back to my mother's womb and be born? The natural. And Jesus said, Except a man be born again of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. And then John 3 verse 8, he talks about the wind blows where it wants to and you can't see it. But you hear the sound of it, so is everyone that's born of the Spirit. There's a sound. So water, right? They're born of water, Spirit. Sound relates to the new natural birth. 
water. If you study, you were floating in your, that's why when the bag of water, is that what they call them? My water broke. It's time to give birth. Right? So there's water, born of water, and the Spirit. The Spirit gives life. And what validates life is the sound. The doctor wants to hear that baby cry. Because when it cries, he says, it's alive. Breath has entered into its lungs and it cries. They used to hit the bottom. I don't think they do that anymore. You know, they're more humane now, like sucking the mucus out of your mouth and your nose. Yeah, that'll make you cry. Amen. But those are related so, so Jesus said, a sower went out to sow, and the seed is the Word of God. It's a parable. We don't take physical seeds and give it to people. Hey, here's the Word of God, right? No, we don't do that. And so it is with the Father and Son. It's a parable of a relationship. And, and all of these, if, if you can't fit the natural into your spiritual application, it's not a proper interpretation of that parable. So the new birth, water, spirit, Holy Ghost, right? So death, burial, resurrection. It's got to all fit into that. Amen. Let's stand and let's pray and let's thank God that He has revealed to us Himself that you and I have this great treasure in our earthen vessels. We know Him. Would you pray that God would give you the desire to teach this to somebody? To reach for somebody. To reach them with the love of God. Amen. And to pray for them, to intercede for them, and not to get tired answering them and loving them. In the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we bless you. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Your nature, all of nature, oh God, speaks, Lord of the oneness of God. It speaks of your glory. It testifies, Lord, of who you are. In the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ. Psalm 119, 1 to 4 talks about the heavens declare the glory of God. It it talks about in verse 2 that it speaks. Nature speaks. And it declares the knowledge of the Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And of course, although nature speaks... It does not convert people. The body of Christ is needed to speak. May God lead you to somebody this week to speak the word of the Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Come early this Sunday for Brother Pascal. Amen. Invite somebody to the house of the Lord. In Jesus' name.